Next, we get those sweet nothings the bridegroom is whispering into his bride's ear. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful, chapter four. Your hair is like a flock of goats <laughs> moving down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like sheep that have come up from washing, all of which bear twins. Your neck is like a tower of David built for an arsenal. So, why are these sweet nothings so ridiculous? Well, uh, you maybe hit it early because... Uh, Otherwise, you're going, what in the world is going on here? But it's not just because we're dealing with a different culture. It's because the bridegroom is actually describing the land of Israel. His bride, Israel, is fruitful with flocks and herds and pomegranates, defended by towers and shields. Oh, let's see, later on. Your belly is a heap of wheat encircled with lilies. Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mi mixed wine. You know, it's all of these agricultural and land metaphors. So he's hungry. Yeah, maybe he's hungry. Okay, that second half of chapter 4 is the most intense scene in the book. This is often seen as a marriage scene, where it's, only, it's the only part of the book where the bridegroom calls his bride, uh, my bride. The rest of the book, you know, she's his love. Here, she's bride. He says, I will hasten to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. Come away with me from Lebanon, my bride. He is comparing the curves and scent of the woman's body to the Temple Mount, which has the aromas of myrrh and frankincense and is built with cedars from Lebanon. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. Why does he call his bride sister? Okay, don't worry, it's not literal. Sibling marriage was outlawed in Israel. Rather, in that culture, it's a way of saying, you're a bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A garden locked, a fountain sealed. In the imagination of ancient Israel, the temple was the locked garden, the Garden of Eden. The temple was uh, decorated inside with, with all those images of Eden. And that these overlapping images of garden, temple, and woodman's body tell us that these are holy places where the human and divine meet. In nature and in human love, but especially at the Mass, and especially inside each and every one of us. Are we good so far? I think so. The bride replies, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. Blow upon my garden, let its fragrance be wafted abroad. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. Here the bride summons the winds, which is something that only God does in scripture. And she invites the Holy Spirit to blow upon her, that her fragrance may be wafted abroad, that God may find her enticing and enter her. And he does. The bridegroom's reply, I come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gather my myrrh with my spice. I eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. God comes into us to enjoy the fruits of the Spirit in us, to revel in us. This is one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. Every morning I begin my personal prayer time with the words, O oh God, make my heart a garden of your peace, a garden where you delight to dwell. I examine my heart to see if it is a, a fit dwelling place for God, if it's peaceful, or if there's any thought or worry or action that needs <clears throat> cleaned out. And like the bride here, I invite God to come in and make me his beautiful garden, his dwelling place. Eat, O oh friends, and drink. Drink deeply, O oh lovers. The impression here is that of celebration and complete satisfaction. For the Jews, this imagery of eating and drinking would have evoked a sacrificial meal in the temple. And for us, it evokes the Eucharist, when Jesus' body comes into our own. We are all invited to find God like this in prayer. St. Francis de Sales talked of the eating and drinking here as meditative and contemplative prayer, respectively. In meditative prayer, you chew on the word and see what comes up. In contemplative prayer, he says, you must dare to get drunk, 
to contemplate God so frequently and so ardently is to be quite out of self, to be wholly taken up in God. And that's what love is, giving ourselves away to the one we love and receiving him in return. He must increase, I must decrease. Then right after this scene of intense intimacy, we get a missed connection. Chapter 5, verse 2. I slept, but my heart was awake. Hark, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. Does this verse remind us of anything in the New Testament? Hark, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. There we go. That's the last few verses right there. So the woman hears her beloved's <clears throat> voice at the door and her heart thrills within her. Yet she hesitates to open the door. I had put off my garment. How could I put it on again? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them again? By the time she makes the decision to get up, her lover is gone. She goes out to find him, but she can't find him. She roams the city and calls for the watchman, where is my beloved? And instead, she gets beat up. <laughs> she says to her friends, if you find my beloved, tell him I am sick with love. Sick with love. Sick with love. Love sick. That's a lot of days, isn't it? Jesus calls and we just don't get out of bed. Or uh, we don't make time for contemplative prayer. Or we do, and we still don't find him. And when we look for him and we still don't find him, sometimes it feels an awful lot like getting beaten up. And coming right after the ecstatic love scene at the end of chapter 4, that's a hard blow. Wait, what? I thought, I thought because up until this point it's all been up, 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 and away. Now where are we going? Crash. The woman is suffering. She can't find her lover, and yet she is not discouraged. She persists, not only in searching for her beloved, but in praising him. My beloved is all radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. His head is the finest gold, his locks are wavy, black as a raven, and so on and so forth. Quite a long passage there. And through praise, she once again seems to find him. Has that been an experience for any of us? When we can set our minds on praise of God, we find him. When we can set our mind on thanking God, we find him. When we uh, list off all his attributes and all the things he's done for us and for the world, Song of Solomon style, we find him. Uh, this really does work, making a huge list of God, I thank you for this. I praise you for this. Thank you so much for doing this. He really does love to be wooed that way. What can I say? So she finds him again. She ends this part with, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He pastures his flock among the lilies. Uh, we still have, what, three more chapters to go. Fortunately, it pretty well mirrors the first three chapters. Like I said, first part mirrors the second part. So I'm just going to pick up on a few things. When the woman praises the man... His head is the finest gold, his arms are rounded gold, set with jewels. There's a lot of statue talk going on there. Except, uh, think of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. Head of gold, chest of silver, feet of clay. There's no feet of clay here. His legs are alabaster columns set upon bases of gold. Oh, this is way better than any of those false <laughs> gods. Then in chapter 6, where the man praises the woman, you get some more blatant Israel talk. You're beautiful as Terza, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. But at the very end, on what can be a, on what can seem some, some over-the-top praise of Israel as opposed to a woman, at the very end here, I think you get a really beautiful image of the church. Verses 8 through 10, chapter 6. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and maidens without number. My dove, my perfect one, is only one, the darling of her mother. Flawless to her that bore her. The maidens saw her and called her happy. The queens and concubines also, and they praised her. Who is this that looks forth like the dawn? Fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army with banners. Blessed Mother. The Blessed Mother, in all her perfection. The church, 
accept no imitations. The church sure doesn't seem perfect to us, and yet the church marching throughout history like an army of banners is an awe-inspiring thing indeed. And we will indeed be brought to perfection in heaven. One word there on the last verse, the Shulamite. For the first time in this book, right here, the woman is given a name, the Shulamite. What does this mean? Short answer, she's a female counterpart to Solomon. Solomon's name means peace. He's the peaceful one. Shalom, Solomon, pretty much the same word. Wasn't it the Shulamite woman that took care of uh, King David for his last year? Close, that's the Shunamite woman. And if we, had, uh, if we had more time, I would go into all the Shunammites and every other possible thing this could mean. But right now, I'm just going to stick with the, the best interpretation, which is that this Shulamite is Solomon's worthy female counterpart and woman of peace. So God may use military metaphors to describe the impressiveness of his bride, and yet she is all peace. Finally, in chapter 8, we get a famous passage. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. God, we are bound to him in the new covenant through the sacraments. His seal is on us. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, most vehement flame. Indeed, love is as strong as death. Love overcomes the grave. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. Before the world was created, when uh, chaos was still the, the primeval waters, God existed, love existed. And though the world shall be destroyed, love will never die. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly scorned. Wealth means nothing next to love. Love endures forever. And now we come to the end, once again, with a king, a vineyard, and meddling brothers. We have a little sister, and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build upon her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Here and only here do we get language that sounds like real middling family members planning a real marriage of a real young woman. <laughs> or they're saying, all right, we're going to keep her indoors. We're going to keep her safe. And the woman here is saying, oh, no, no, no. That's not, kind of, that's not the kind of love I'm talking about. She replies here, I was a wall, and my breasts were like towers. Then I won, and then I was in his eyes as one who brings peace. In other words... No, no, no. I am fully grown. I am ready for love. I am God's love. I am God's woman of peace. We think we're not worthy. God begs to differ. God invites us into a love relationship with him. And finally, just to make sure that we know who the real bridegroom is in this story, the book ends with a major jab at Solomon. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He let out the vineyard to keepers. Each was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. Okay, Baal Hamon. You know the word Baal, right? Baal, of course, was a false god. It also meant lord, master, or husband. And the word Hamon means many. Baal Hamon is lord of many things, husband of many. So, that's, uh, that's Solomon. What's Solomon's vineyard? He's the master of many. He's the husband of many. And he let out the vineyard to keepers. My vineyard, my very own, is for myself. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand. And the keepers of the fruit, the two hundred. What she's saying there is, you think the keepers of the fruit aren't getting anything out of this? She's saying the harem's not so safe as it may look, Solomon. And she's adding for good measure, my vineyard, my very own, is for myself. So again, major jab here at the end of the historical Solomon, saying, I'm not talking about an earthly king. I'm talking about the <coughs> heavenly king, the one whose vineyard I am, the one who shines on me, who makes me grow, who makes me beautiful. Oh, you who dwell in the gardens, my companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of spices. 
Make haste, my beloved. In other words, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. It ends like the book of Revelation, looking forward to the eternal divine wedding that is yet to come. Now, you've been through the entire book of Song of Solomon. <laughs> Thoughts, impressions. Let's face it. Some people really love this book. Other people are like, this is not my cup of tea. I have other ways of relating to God. Rather have coffee. <laughs> and yet, I would say, even if you think you're in the second category, don't discount this book. You might be surprised what comes up. All right, let's stand and close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God, that you love us like this. Help us to love you in return. And help us to love you like this. Oh God, send us your Holy Spirit and change us from the inside that we may be your temple, your garden, your dwelling place. The place where your Holy Spirit can live in us and work with us and in us and through us. Thank you, God, that we are called to be with you and simply to enjoy you. We love you, Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.